We're live. We're back. Here we are. Welcome to the Poor Sports Podcast. <laughs> it's a uh, first one from the me, not you, but in the uh, the new what will become the podcast studio. It won't be this like raw drywall behind me or this treadmill that's become a storage space. Uh, <laughs> it's got like a. It's it really. What's funny about this I see in the background is it's got a rib, a rib smoking device on it, which is like completely the antithesis of what the treadmill's for. Uh, how <laughs> so many times like, would you... It's truly like it's, it's been overcome by its <laughs> demons. How many times would you say you use that treadmill? Uh, zero times since we've moved to this house. We uh, When we had it in our apartment, we used it a decent amount. Okay. But uh, okay. yeah, it's, it's a been, treadmill uh, it's in been an apartment. mostly a... Yeah, a treadmill in an apartment is ambitious. There's, you know, I, I mean, I had been to your old apartment, so I know that you had a yes. very big space. But even still, mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of those things that uh, you typically reserve until you get a house. Although, it sounds like you did the opposite. You got it for the apartment, you used it at the apartment, you brought it to the house, and it just takes up space. My wife and I have a real problem with stuff like that. She almost bought a uh, a new dining table the other day. Okay. Presently, our dining table, because we're, so we're, uh, for listeners may or may not know, obviously they know we had a new kid if they've listened uh, recently. But part of this process was we're going to rotate bedrooms around. So my my uh, the old daughter, the old news daughter that we barely care about anymore, <laughs> she'll be in what used to be my office. Uh, my other daughter will. We're it's not quite certain where she's going to move, but the biggest thing is we got to clear a bunch of shit out for my daughter to move into that office. And uh, we, this is a classic thing we do: is we buy something. Well, we have not cleared out the space that it's going to go into. So my wife almost bought a dining table as right now our dining room is our dining table is pushed up against the wall and we have shit that's going in our dining room that's going to donation, shit that's going to the dump, shit that's going to go into the garage. Like it's a variety. It's like a <laughs> staging area for the rest of our life. And yeah. she almost bought a, a 10 foot long dining table because we want to get a bigger dining table and which almost did that while we are already presently using our dining table as like a glorified shelf. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I mean, I think the real sign of adulthood is being able to give up things that you own, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's so many people, especially it feels like our parents' generation is maybe the generation that struggled most with this. I mean, yes. you can walk down the, the street that you live on and if people start open up their garages you'll see just most of those garages are just crammed full of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I think our generation, maybe younger generations have gotten better about just like purging things, but like everyone gets so tied to like the, the sunk cost Mm -hmm. and just the, the idea that if I spent, you know, a couple hundred bucks on something a few years ago, I have to like squeeze every cent out of that forever and ever and ever. And it's like, look, you can just, you can donate anything. You can throw stuff out. Yeah. You can replace it. That's totally okay. You do that with things like clothing. Why can't mm-hmm. you do that with stuff in your home? So yeah, I totally get it, man. It's it's a it's a process. It's good that you guys are finding things that you can donate. Yeah, we and so we have uh, uh, very close to us. I won't say how close, but we have a thrift mission thrift in Tacoma, which is like a you know, it's like a thrift store, but they some of the stuff goes to the Tacoma Rescue Mission which is actually a good cause. Those, some of those other places, I don't even think like it is a good cause anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I mean, I took stuff to Goodwill a couple of weeks ago. And when I pulled up, you know, they do like the drive up donations. And I pulled up out there. There was like one guy working that entire donation area. And there was so much stuff. I mean, I can't yeah. even explain. Like, I don't even think they probably moved a lot of this stuff inside. Maybe during the summertime, they just like leave it out there. Who cares? Sure. But there was so much stuff that I was like, man, me dropping this off is actually probably causing more harm than good at this point. Like, they're not going to be able to go through all this stuff anytime soon, especially with just one or two people working here. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, everyone's go to, it feels like, is a place like Goodwill or or like the one by your house. Or now they even have the bins in the grocery store parking lots where you can just go throw your wrapped up clothes. And it's like, look, I know, especially around here, people have all sorts of issues with just throwing things away and not recycling or reusing. But sometimes it's better to just throw stuff away. Like there's no harm in that. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, well, and I, and I'm, uh, I will say I'm because I've bought a lot of stuff used like microphones and stuff. I bought them used. I have a pretty good idea of what their used value is. So I do have some stuff that I will be hanging on to for too long and selling. 
But I also don't know if I drop like a podcast mic into a Goodwill if they're going to really if it's you know <laughs> they won't know a, what to do with it. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, they don't exactly. Know I, I did. Uh, I was so today when I, I went and dropped some stuff off today, and I saw these people unloading just like it's like not just furniture, but it's like maybe pieces of furniture that aren't even. It's not a full thing. It's like oh yeah, here's a bracket from another thing yeah. <laughs> that's not even included here. And I'm watching the lady, and I'm like, oh fuck. I hope I bet they do this sometimes when we leave too. But I'm watching her just like, what the fuck do I do with this? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. No, I know. People in my neighborhood are big on just throwing stuff out at the end of the driveway with the free sign sure. on it. And every now and then, I would say like 10% of the time, something that they put out there is useful and good. Sure. 90% of the time, it's trash that they don't want to pay to have disposed, right? Like everyone's so weird about paying to have their stuff disposed. And I get it. Uh, you know, if it doesn't fit in your, your bin, then at that point, you're you're finding some ways through money to get rid of this stuff. But, uh, you can't just throw it out on the curb. You can't litter. You can't just litter and be like, if it has a free sign on it, it's okay that it's litter. I will say we, so we, the apartment building we came from, there was, uh, like in the laundry room, there were a couple tables and you could put stuff on, uh, those tables and like our stuff, uh, I, I can't speak for everyone's stuff. Our stuff would be gone very quickly. There was also a lady that worked there that I think, I don't know what she does. Maybe I, I can't imagine it's like as altruistic as taking it to homeless shelters and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But she takes a lot of it. I don't know what the reason is. I don't know what she's doing with it. It doesn't really matter to me. Uh, but we have been guilty of putting some stuff out on the street. And I will say our success rate is higher than the 10% rate that you yeah. quote. I'd say we're about an 80% success rate, but there is some stuff that you eventually pick it up like soaking wet and take it to your garbage behind your house. Yeah, and, no, uh, I totally get it, man. There, I have a neighbors a few doors down from us that left just like this decrepit set of table and chairs out front. And it had to be like two to three months that it was sure. just sitting out there. And uh, at some, I don't know ultimately what happened to it. <laughs> I don't. I don't think anyone came along to take it. I imagine uh, at some point it just got thrown out because it sat mm-hmm. there in the rain and all the weather. And uh, you know, there's like a, a at some. I know we all have our our levels of laziness, but that was that was up there. I gotta say. Yeah. Uh, okay. Before we get into sports stuff, I have a knee update. Uh, oh wow. <laughs> Big news. So I got an MRI on Sunday uh, because it has not healed in like the manner that you'd hope for for a torn meniscus uh, oh, no. yet. And uh, it turns out I also partially tore my ACL. Wow. Okay. So that that's a lot different. I mean, a meniscus yeah. is like, of course, everybody bases any injury like this off what they see in sports. And it's sure. like you're dealing with the totally different beast in sports. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like not only is it, are these professional athletes usually, or at least high level athletes, but on yeah. top of that, they have in-house healthcare. Usually they have doctors that are that are the best yeah, of the I, best. I had to wait. I had to wait three weeks to get an MRI. They get an MRI that day yeah, in that the, day. the team's yeah. MRI facility. You wow. know what I mean? A partially torn ACL is no joke. So now yeah. uh, this is really going to put a damper on your sports career. Yeah. So so it's. Uh, I believe it's the description. So I've, I haven't seen the. I see the orthopedic doctor tomorrow. Uh, but I'm doing like, yeah, that sports research, like what, like, what is a, so it's like, I think, but based on description from the radiologist, it's between a grade one and a grade two sprain. So I think a grade two sprain is typically hard to walk on and Mm -hmm. I can walk on this fine. Grade one sprain usually isn't tearing. It's just, uh, just like stretching of the, the ligament. So I I think I'm in between those because I can walk on it fine. We'll see. I don't. It's not necessarily going to require surgery, but it is like a better explanation of why we are five weeks into this and I. It's not healed. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, this is. I feel like this is good for your stand-up career, though. I mean, not literally yeah. standing up. That's yeah. bad. But for the material that you will get out of this for comedy, that's important. Yeah, especially do, if you have to wear one of those big Don Joy braces. You know, the big knee braces. Like, if you do end up needing surgery and have to wear one of those braces and you get to go up on stage in one of those, I mean, yeah. you could build an entire set off of that. Yeah, it's, uh, I will, I think maybe it's a testament to how long I've been doing comedy. I think it's it's really a measure of a comedian how quickly you experience adversity and then go, fuck, there's a bit in this. And it was oh, like, yeah. I literally, so if you remember the story, it happens in my backyard and I hop into the house and I was not 
in the house yet before I was like, this is a fucking bit. I literally injured my knee <laughs> barbecuing two days, three days before my, my 37th birthday. This is yeah. this is a bit in the making. So, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, there, that is one nice thing about comedy. It's you get to subsidize tragedy with, <laughs> with like the, <laughs> with the, the makings of a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's important here. Well, man, speedy recovery to you. I mean, yeah. Hopefully it all works out. Yeah, I think I, 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 I have a renewed optimism that I won't require surgery. I was kind of heading in like mentally preparing myself for surgery. And now I'll have I have some optimism based on what I've read that uh, it won't require surgery. But I have a, a an appointment with the orthopedic doctor tomorrow. So we'll see. OK, I will say outside of uh, hearing about like dogs tear their ACLs, you're the first person who wasn't doing athletics to tear your ACL <laughs> as far as I know I've never heard of another one I'm I know there has to be people out there that have just been like walking along and tore their ACL do you uh you remember the comedian on the first Bickerson show um Greg Beachler by the way Bickerson's yes. July 29th we're returning I'll be hosting Scott Lossie who was my my the, when I started comedy and right before I started comedy he was my favorite local comic very good friend of mine he's headlining vanessa dawn featuring uh, my friend allison fine is doing a guest spot i'll be hosting and it'll be that's and i we don't have any we don't have any scheduled after that i don't necessarily think that means there won't be any but it would be very convincing to continue to do it if you guys showed up you know yeah it's a good good venue and uh very nice and chill yeah know, so like, the if you're not one of those people that likes going to comedy clubs for whatever reason, I'm sure there's sure. people, maybe it's too dark, maybe you don't like the seating arrangements, you know, whatever it might be. It's expensive. This they is, can be very expensive. It, it can be pricey. Yeah, this is a nice, easy way to kind of like ease your way into a comedy show and feel like you're really just like hanging out at a bar. Yeah. And uh, so the guy that was the middle, the first show at Bickerson's, Greg Beachler, has a joke. I don't know if he did it that night and I don't want to ruin it, butcher it completely. I don't want to, but I'm going to. Uh, he has a joke because he's uh, half white, half black, and he has a joke how he's like he's not even that good of a black guy. He's like a starter kit black guy, and he's like, uh, yeah, like I've gotten suntan or I've gotten uh, sunburned twice, and uh, he goes, yeah, I tore my ACL at a basketball game. Uh, I was in the stands watching, so, which is so true. Like that did happen at the, the okay, Spokane so there's Hoop one Fest. guy. There's one guy who yeah, wasn't thank doing you. athletics. Thank yeah. you, Greg Beachler, for uh, for doing that for me. You two are ago. really kindred spirits. I mean, I know you've talked a lot about Greg on this. this pod. <laughs> if you if, if you heard anything else I've said about him on this podcast, that we are not kindred spirits. I'd be I'd be worried that you might be headed towards diabetes if yeah. <laughs> at this rate. We know Greg's a diabetic. So what does that mean? He's for a you? filthy diabetic. <laughs> diabetic uh yeah no it's uh it's gonna be a rough it could be a rough rough path for me coming up <laughs> I, basically it is you, a, you just take on all the bad stuff that happens to greg i don't know if there's any good stuff happening you never know if there's any good stuff happening to comedians because they don't talk about the good stuff it's not that right. exciting but all the bad stuff that he's talked about seems to be headed your way <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that is very true that the comedians really do focus on their own personal tragedies. I will say uh, this will probably never come out, but I wrote like chapter one of a probably a very bad book uh, the other day that I was like, <laughs> this is like kind of funny this because I grew up playing sports and I like knew like like you said, ACL tears. I've been hearing about ACL tears for 37 years. And when I finally get one, it's fucking barbecuing. It's the worst, the worst possible way. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, so you've reached the book writing phase of unemployment is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow, that was uh, great! <laughs> rough, rough place to be. We've all been there. Oh, but I will say I've started many books. Uh, so this one, don't nobody get their hopes up. But um, <laughs> that's a hilarious so, observation. I think somebody should release a book that is just one page of each book that they started, like the that, first that's page. That's a great of each, idea. I think that would actually be. An entertaining book because anybody who has written before or been in comedy or any of those types of things, because I've done the same thing. There's been points in my life where I'm like, I should write a book and I'll start it and I'll write the first page and then I'll never, ever touch it again. It's like, I don't even know what I was like trying to get at there. But if you just put all of those into like an anthology and sold it as a book itself, it could work. It could work. People could build off those stories. I, I agree. This is not my idea, but uh, I heard it from someone. And I thought it was pretty brilliant. Networks should take all the 
failed pilots that they have. Because there's like, it, I, I don't know if everyone knows this, like when you see a show get made, like The Office gets made, it was probably one out of like 15 shows that got pilots. Yeah. The rest, sometimes none of them get made. One will get made a lot of the time and then it's rare that there's multiple. So there's just every year, there's just dozens of these shows, if not hundreds of shows that get made and they're what, for whatever reason, they're not good enough. And uh, some of them are probably would have been great. Sometimes you see a show get greenlit. Like if you see, if you watch season one of Seinfeld and then you know what the ratings were in season two, somebody had absolutely brilliant foresight because that show is dog shit season one. It's yeah, probably it's my rough. favorite show that's ever been on TV. Yeah. But you watch season one, and you're, especially the pilot. You watch the pilot, you're like, this is like, this is unwatchable. This looks like college film, you know? <laughs> season one of a lot of shows is usually bad. I mean, yeah. you, it's basically, if you can get through season one as a show, I'm sure that's when the money starts to roll and that's when you get the budget. That's when you get, yeah. you probably have to take all the, all the critical feedback you never wanted to hear as a show yeah. creator, you have to take and like actually apply, but that's when the show gets good. So it, it makes sense. I, yeah. Listen, I disagree. I want to just, especially with a writer's strike going on right now that I'm not involved with, by the way. And this thing that like all comics are supposed to get behind the writer's strike. I disagree with, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'll go be a scab right now. I'm not, I'm not a, uh, but I will say I don't, I, the one thing I will defend is I don't think that the corp, like the corporate notes are, uh, are probably actually, good get that shit out of there let the artistic people do their shit let the editors fix it in post you know and, yeah, yeah. Um, this is also this is like the world's longest writer strike because there's been writer strikes before i mean we've sure. all like if you've ever seen an interruption in your favorite tv show but i was thinking about this the other day i mean this writer strike has been going on since basically like the beginning of this year yeah and uh i can't remember <clears throat> one going this long before and i basically i was basing uh my SNL viewing off the writer's strike because SNL is probably one of the most impacted shows sure. from a writer's strike because it's live every week, right? So yeah. it's like once that thing goes off the air, that's when you kind of know the writers are on strike and I, they lost like half a season basically right. to this strike. And I was thinking about it and I was like, man, you know, the last time we had one of these writer's strikes was that, that was sizable was probably about like 15 years ago. Because uh, I remember The Office being interrupted. There's like one season of The Office mm. where all the episodes are like 45 minutes long instead of 25 minutes long. It's because they were trying to make up from coming back from this writer's right. strike. And uh, back when they used to have these strikes, people, you know, average TV viewers like you and I would demand that, you know, these studios make amends, right? That yeah. they make up with the writers because we needed our TV back. Now everything's streaming. So right. it's like... There's so much that they already have in the hopper that they can release. It's like that has to hurt writers, right? Like they've just so much yeah. content that they can just put out there that people will just consume because it's on Netflix or, you know, some, what other streaming service you might use, Hulu, Amazon, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough, tough place to be for the writers out there. Man. Yeah. I mean, I think definitely the studios have insulated themselves. I mean, like any like any industry, they've insulated themselves from the the leverage that the, the writers yeah. might have. and. And uh, not to like, I'm not, uh, I've actually never worked for a union, surprisingly, because I did do some manual labor early in my career. I've never worked for a union at all. I don't have strong feelings either way. My dad was a contractor. He was not a big fan of unions because he had to hire people. So yeah. uh, my mom worked at a school district, works at a school district, and it's uh, unions are good for her. So I don't know. I uh I think that the thing that's never faced writers before is AI being able to do like such a convincing job. Yeah, and, that's tough. And I do think though, like the big AI freak out, because you're, it's always like, is this going to be the internet or is it going to be like 3D movies? You know what I mean? Like, it, it, we've had like four laps on 3D movies, and I don't know a single person that owns a 3D television, or if they do, they also own like a PT Cruiser and a they own like the the thing of the time of every time, right? They're probably holding on to a PT Cruiser because they think it's going to become a classic at some point, like our previous conversation. And uh, I do think AI is starting to, we're kind of starting to see the like kind of the 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 edge is dulling a little bit and we're not as, cause there was like that. Do you remember that? Uh, well, I mean, literally I am a victim of it, but like that, that, uh, huge drop off in, or that huge spike in unemployment rate, uh, because AI was coming around. And I remember being very 
worried about it a couple months before I got laid off because a coworker of mine was like, Hey, I taught, I was like working with him to write, uh, uh, some code to, for a report. And I was like showing him how to write it. And he's like, Oh, thank you. I really appreciate your help. Now that you've shown me, can I show you something? And he literally asked AI to write a report like we wrote. Yeah. He just didn't understand the terminology. It wrote the code more efficiently than I did and faster by far. I mean, it took us an hour of going over it. It took me years of training to get to this point. And it was like, <laughs> hey, could you write this code with this information? And it was like, like spits out. I was like, God damn. But... Yeah, it does feel yeah. like the bloom's coming off the rose a little bit on AI. That's why the game is entertainment and podcasting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't, the replace, only stable the, you can't industry. replace that with AI. You, the only stable industry is podcasting. <laughs> entertainment, uh, any sort of entertainment, basically. Okay, we do need to get to sports, but I did want to comment because I didn't last week. It looks like you're losing a bit of the mural in the back there. It looks like you've... Uh, You've started to to. Oh, we're covering it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're getting ready for our, our baby, so we're yes. moving stuff around. Uh, there's now a dresser in front of the big uh, mountain display that often took place in this this room here. So I am liking uh, the the. Uh, first off, I think that this dresser having more stuff in that room has improved the acoustics. Uh, it probably has. Yeah, there used to be a little bit of an echo in here. Just yeah, because <laughs> the only thing that was actually in the room space was my my office setup that's yes it. and um, uh once my, once my wife started moving things in here there, now there's a plant <laughs> yeah the plant's just sucking up all those uh sound waves i like the hat storage you have though I, this is pretty good it's like so these are rigid boxes and i assume there's oh, yeah. like several hats in each box you can you can, you can buy the actually i just got some more because i have way too many hats and uh Yesterday was Amazon Prime Day. Oh, I it's today, Amazon Prime Day still. right now. Yeah, yeah. what? Tell so me, I, send send me the. I'll buy it on the fucking yeah, podcast. The, the ones I have are from a, a brand called Boxy B O X Y. So if you just go search it, they should be giving us money now. I don't think they have any sort of marketing or advertisement, but there's a lot of these companies that like sell these little boxes and they're are they just, just hat hat boxes or hat something? boxes? Yeah, and uh, they can be used for uh, like sneakers too. A lot of people will buy them for sneakers. Uh, but I just use mine for is hats. It a you, you can fit like hat 10. organizer for yeah, yeah. There, you can fit like ten hats in in each one of those things. So it's it's pretty nice to have. The thing is, I have those, and yet my hats are still everywhere. Of they're course, not, they're of very course. rarely actually organized in their bins because then I'll take them out and wear them, and I never end up putting them back like I'm supposed to. All right, you need to send me a link to this because it's not obvious from what I'm looking at. But and we don't need to take up too much of the podcast with this, but. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, baby's still on schedule. We're gonna ruin the. Yeah, we're like. We're gonna uh, get, by the time this studio gets created, you will have quit this podcast. Well, <laughs> I mean, if I'm just sitting here, totally doable. But yeah, we're like eight weeks away at this point, so uh, everything's good. Now we're just at the point, as we've been the last few weeks, where we have to do stuff around the house. And, sure. Um, just get ready for that sort of thing, you know. Like I, I'm looking, I, I'm really looking forward to it. Not just because I'm going to be having a kid, but sure. like taking a couple months off work isn't going to hurt. <laughs> you know, I'm ready for that yeah. part of it too. Uh, so yeah, all those things. I mean, we're we're having a baby right as summer is coming to an end, and I don't know how. Like I, I know there's a lot of people around this area that love the fall and love the rain and love the gray. I am as far from one of those people as oh, you get. I love the summertime so the fact that we're able to kind of like maximize our summer and just as the summer's ending we're going to be having a baby and that's the time when we just be like sitting inside anyway you know like it's it's, it's it'll be nice timing. to have seasonal depression and postpartum depression at the same time you <laughs> yeah, know to have those things really <laughs> I've, I'm that person I don't think I actually get seasonal depression but sure. man it is it's a lot harder to wake up when the sun rises later and sets so much earlier and and it's gray all day and you never see the sun like i probably shouldn't live here if we're being honest yeah. but this is the only place i've lived so you know what's funny is are. this is the first year where i've like really appreciated the day length in the summer i was like i'm gonna get to golf so much this summer and then i fucking <laughs> <laughs> and then you had a kid and i ruined and my you injured yourself yeah my knee yeah. i think i could probably have squeezed a couple rounds of golf in honestly my wife is i mean i'm out here doing this this what we're doing now is going to take as long as nine holes would take roughly let's pretend that is true when i make this argument to my wife in a couple <laughs> months when my knees healed uh, the thing but, well that's the thing about golfing in general like when you when you get permission to go golf or you, you tell your partner that you're going to go golf 
uh, you always just you the time you give them is the time that the round takes the bare minimum too. you're yes. like oh that's about four hours like that's a speedy round of 18 holes right and there's no commute inc- yeah that's not including travel time not including warm-up time not including the dick around time afterwards where you might have a drink or some food or sit with your buddies it probably ends up being closer to about seven hours if we're being honest but uh no you always you always give the abbreviated time yeah of course of course (laughs) um and i will say i can if uh the stars align and there's no groups ahead of us and uh especially if i'm i mean i can do pull around off in under three hours which is crazy because i'm not good at golf like the the (laughs) it's a lot of shots fit into those three hours you know but uh I can I can do that. I'm I'm pretty good at keeping the pace up, but yes, you're out, there's so much that's out of your control pace wise. Yeah, and it includes the people. Uh, um, it includes the people who I'm sorry. I have this fucking MacBook, and one of the biggest beefs I have with Macs now because I don't like I never liked Macs. I've <laughs> learned things to like about it, but you get text messages on your screen, and it's like I'm now I'm like distracted by my wife texting me about my daughter. I'm uh, anyway. You can what, probably turn those things off, but know, at the same I, time, you probably need them. So I want I them at times, and then I don't want them right now, and I don't want to put everything on Do Not Disturb. It's a whole the Mac ecosystem is really just eating me up right now. It's it's fucking want, me right in the ass. Commands your attention. Yes. All right. Do you want yeah. to talk about some sports? Let's do it. What do we got today? Um, we have uh, we can talk about Tom Brady a little bit. We Victor Wembanyama. Uh, we're just going to keep hammering this Wembenyama train to see how many times I can screw up his last name. Yes. I'm not usually one of those people that like cannot pronounce something, but man, Victor Wembenyama has really yeah. thrown well, I was surprised at how uh, at how bad you did cuz I've like I mean even like I'm not an NBA guy anymore, you either, and I got onto Takumpo pretty quickly. I was pretty thrilled. I can do onto Takumpo. Yeah. I, yeah, I can that one rolls right off the tongue. It doesn't make any sense. If you give me a few years with Wembenyama, maybe I'll get there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one. I think that's fine. Uh, uh, I sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm this fucking text messages, lady. Leave me alone. Um, I yeah, I think you'll get there. Also, there's not enough people to get mad. There's not enough people listening this to get mad at us for mispronouncing a guy's name. Uh, anyway, Wemby, Victor Wembanyama, Yama. Y- I will say Yana and Yama. I'm struggling with because I feel like that's sh- where it is. That's yeah. where it gets you. It's yes. That, it should should be an N at the end. Yes, I am. I agree with you, and I also think it feels like the most people make the other mistake. The they make the the N to M conversion, not the M right. to N conversion. And so, uh, yes, I'm I'm I am struggling with that part. It's like myself. people that can't pronounce Chipotle. You know, there's a there's yes. a whole Chipotle or or people that say nuclear. Uh, yeah, nuclear is nuclear is somewhat annoying. The chip the Chipotle over chipotle really gets me because there's a lot of people that just they're there they cannot say chipotle <laughs> yeah and it's the restaurant's been around i mean the pepper has been around for a long time obviously but the restaurant <laughs> we're in like the third decade of this restaurant i think like you gotta get it right at this point yeah i there's no excuse some, just, some people will call it chipotle and not like ironically and that's fucking wild to me <laughs> or just abbreviate it you know yeah. if you're still struggling just chipotle's so uh, we're going to talk about old Victor Wembanyama. Uh, the All Star Game was this week. The the uh, I think we should start. I think we should start there. That seems like okay, as, that's fine. It's it's a big big topic, and obviously, if, if you're listening locally, which I would have to imagine most people a big are, chunk of people are, yeah, a big it's a big uh, local topic as well. Did you? Yeah. Did you watch any of the all-star events this weekend? Yeah, I watched the home run derby beginning to end, which was a real challenge because my my uh, the old forgotten daughter was <laughs> dying to watch. And if she, listen, if we didn't have the new daughter, maybe she would have gotten her way and she'd have gotten to watch some Disney Plus shit. But now that she's old and forgotten, sorry, kid, we're watching the home run derby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yeah the derby, and I will say the derby. It always takes longer than you think. Yeah, you I saw on the on the TV listing it was scheduled for two hours, which was truly the golf round estimation of sporting events. It really is. Yeah, I don't know how they thought they were getting that into two. It was more like three and a half. It's like yeah, 
first of all, it's going to start about a half hour later than it actually says it's going to start because they got to do intros. And then these guys all kind of just like mill around a little bit and they kind of start on their own time. There's no real sense of urgency during the home run derby. And it makes sense. I mean, if you're an actual competitor in this thing, like you you can tell by the second round, a lot of these guys are gassed out. So, sure. You know, pacing yourself. But also, even even if you just go on like the raw time, most of these guys got four minutes to hit home runs in the first round, right? Right. Right. And that, and then so take like the, the, Let's say at like the very best golf round estimation, you have the timeout, you have the uh, the time in between the bonus round and the and the main. You're like at least five minutes per person, eight round. That's forty minutes right there, and then there's like another couple rounds, and so that's if you do like no in between. <laughs> yeah. None of these guys pose with each other. They're like we're not doing any recap or review, and obviously none of that's happening. It's like a big festivity, which it was cool. But yeah, the, that time frame was like so obviously going to be a problem. Hey, <laughs> yeah. let me ask you this: How was it last year? The first year that they went to the timed first round or timed I rounds? I can't remember if it was last. I don't think it was last year. I think it's been a couple years now. Uh, it hasn't been very long. It hasn't okay. been very long. Uh, I originally thought, you know, the home run derby to me is when it comes to all the various all star games, it's probably the one of the more exciting events mm-hmm. with the, dunk, the dunk contest and the home run derby are by far the most watched i would have to imagine yeah. events that are not the actual all-star games of the major sports and uh the derby has i liked the old format you basically just got 10 outs under the old format you could theoretically hit infinite home runs yes right because any swing that is not anytime you swing the bat and the ball doesn't leave the yard then it's an out and you only get 10 outs right yeah. but if you go on a run you could just keep hitting home runs until the day ends if you want to, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I liked that format because of that. And I thought when they moved to the time format, what we would see is like a dramatic decrease in home runs. And it's actually been the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. It's like you give these guys three minutes to, home run, to hit home runs and somehow they will just start swinging the bat like crazy and just they'll really put on a show. And I think that's actually where I thought it was going to be it was going to suffer because of that change. I think it's actually improved the format a little bit. Yeah, I will say my opinion. So this was, I think, the first home run derby I've watched since the format change, however many years it's been. Um, I I will say, like, overall in sports, all-star festivities have kind of, I've lost almost all interest in them. I'm not not very interested. I mean, this was a fun home run derby. Also, it's in Seattle, obviously. When I when it first comes on, one of the things that was cool about the home run derby is you'd get to see a home run is such an amazing event because literally you go from nobody's moving to this ball is hit 500 feet in a matter of seconds, right? Like it's it's such an incredible like turn of fortune. And when you kind of it's almost like you commoditize it by making it this thing that we got to squeeze as many as we can in in three minutes, yeah. and you lose <laughs> elements of what makes a home run magical. Seeing someone catch it in the stands, seeing where it lands in the stadium, all that stuff you kind of lose. I did watch the StatCast broadcast, which is maybe the nerdiest thing about me that's ever happened, is I watched the StatCast <laughs> broadcast on ESPN2 of the Home Run Derby, and they did have on the other side, so they had the screen of the batter, and then on the other side, they had like a kind of like a shot tracer kind of thing or a, sure. a track man image yeah. of where of where the ball was going. That was nice. I will say my my one bitch with that specific broadcast, and I don't think it was happening as often on the regular broadcast, but they would do the behind the catcher view of the batter. Yeah. And to me, that view you lose every part of what I like about a home run because you can't really see on like a it's like a one third of the screen basically because it's it's half the screen and then it's like there's some shit on top and bottom you can't really see the ball leaving the bat very well you're trusting this like i don't know if this was on the regular broadcast but they're you're trusting these like track man pads that are but even then it was a cool thing about track man is you'd see launch angle and speed yeah that was kind of cool you did you watch any of the Statcast broadcast i didn't watch this i just watched the main broadcast but gotcha. i did see i saw a lot of people complaining about the broadcast and I kind of wasn't a huge fan of the broadcast either. They were basically doing on the main broadcast, they were doing a split screen, you know, one just kind of focused on the batter like you'd normally see and watching his swing. And then one trying to track every ball as it, 
as it left the bat, right? right. So it was very herky jerky. It yeah. was all over the place. I, I have to imagine if you were the cameraman in charge of trying to track those home run balls, it was a real pain in your ass. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's where the format changes of recent years have kind of like hurt the production value of the broadcast. When you had the old format, every swing in and of itself was kind of an, an event, right? Because yeah, there it was like so dramatic. Right, because there was no timing element. So you could kind of take your time, pace yourself. There was a pitch, you would swing. And if it wasn't a home run, they didn't necessarily have to track it with a camera. Mm-hmm. If they knew it was gone off the bat, they could track it or, or watch it go. And the, the camera could follow it all the way. Now it's like, if you're following the path of a home run ball, they're already taking another swing before that thing even lands because they have to worry about the clock. Yeah, I thought I thought that the like the so the, I, there's things that I like about the new format. It, it is very fun. I get that. What you liked about the the home run derby in its previous format is that every pitch had some like small essence of that game seven of the World Series like very dramatic moment. Right, yeah. this pitch is literally either going to be a home run or an out. Like, these are the two options. And that was, I thought, like... So I almost wish they would switch. I like it in the first round. I wish they would change it. One, one thing I will say I find annoying always is when they do this massive format change and they're like, well, Julio Rodriguez broke the record. It's like the record is two years old or one year old. Like, it's <laughs> he he broke a record that's that, like, this format only existed a year ago. Like, he, think, he's the best yeah. of six people that have ever done this or something like that. It'd, it'd be interesting to see the stats on if you were applying the old format rules to their swing in the three minutes how it would like translate to outs like how many balls did they swing and hit that did not leave the stadium you know julio julio's display was incredibly impressive 41 home runs in (laughs) i mean 41 home runs in basically four minutes is just that's nuts man like well, Most I, of us will never experience that feeling of being able to do that ever. You yeah, know? but in any in there's no amount of time you could give me where I'm hitting a home run. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's just nuts. It's just nuts to think that that is like that can even be achieved and to do it. it you know, it, especially knowing how much it's like a cardio workout now. It yeah. honestly like the like you. There's so many things that you have to take into consideration when you're kind of looking at the derby now. Before, it was just like, whoever is the biggest dude, he can take as much time as he wants. He's going to hit a ton of home runs. Now, it's like they're, they talk about like body types and who's really sure. built for this, who won't gas out as the, well, and as the, the guy that goes on. The guy that won is the guy who you were probably most you thought was most likely to gas out Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And an interesting thing, what I will say, the reason I like it is because it adds some strategy and Guerrero is like a perfect example of this because his coach partway, I don't know if they did, talked about this on the, the regular broadcast, but on the stack cast broadcast, they pointed it out uh, later in his uh, first round, the coach goes, Hey, I'm going to start throwing it high and inside because from that spot, Vlad could just use his hands. He didn't have to use yeah. <clears throat> his lower body as much. And that kind of stuff is like, it is kind of a wrinkle of strategy. And I did think it was kind of, it's interesting. Like, the pitcher is such a part of it now because before, if the pitcher was shitty, you just take those pitches, right? Yeah. But now the pitcher is kind of like the, he's like 25% of the victory probably goes to the pitcher. Yeah. There really is a lot of strategy to it. I mean, I think, you know, even probably like a decade ago, there probably wasn't as much strategy as there is now. Uh, But now there's such a focus on, whoever is pitching these balls to you like everyone was talking about julio's pitcher being like the greatest derby pitcher of all time and if you watch this guy he was really good he got the ball out of there quick a lot of these pitchers even even though they're only like 40 feet away you know as opposed to being the normal distance away from home plate they often will kind of have a slower wind up or you know they'll take time grabbing the balls out of the bin and and being able to deliver them this dude was like a machine i mean he was he didn't take hardly any step when he threw. It was just like it was like a catcher's motion, just kind of a. He flick was of the a, wrist. he was a minor league catcher. I don't know. Okay, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, and it was just like a little flick of the wrist, and every ball was in the exact same spot. I like what you're saying about uh, Vladdy and his manager John, John Schneider, Schneider was throwing yeah. to him. Yeah, uh, that is actually a really good strategy. Vladdy's one of those guys who's like just 
once your lower half gasses out, he's strong enough, and you can just see it. He in was his still hitting balls four fifty with just yeah, his arms, just his hands. Yeah, that's really like they, you know, they had a game plan and they tailored it to him, and it worked out great. But for Julio's guy, it was like, hey, I'm just going to throw the ball to the exact same spot every yeah. single time, and you're going to adjust to it. And he did, and he was, you know, Julio's one of those guys that can hit a home run to all fields, so it's yeah. it's no problem for him to adjust. But um, yeah, I mean, overall, I, I, it was. You know, I think the actual All Star game is kind of boring because sure. it's usually it's usually pitching dominated, and uh, it, it lulls in the middle. And it did. I mean, we if you happen to watch it yesterday, it it really kind of like carried. I guess the beginning part kind of carried the entire production, right? Like, sure, you have the fanfare early on, the intros, um, just the start of the game, and seeing like the best stars and the starters can be compelling. But you get to the middle innings and. You got these no-name guys who are the de facto all-stars from the worst teams in baseball getting a chance to play. No one really cares about that stuff, you know? Uh, so the Derby, I feel like, is kind of the event of the entire weekend and just makes it uh, makes it more fun overall. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, And I think that's true of, and I, I put these on our list, but the like the NBA All-Star game, I don't care about the game at all. The dunk yeah. contest and the three-point contest are so much more entertaining. Right. The NFL, the Pro Bowl was like, unwatchable yeah. and last year there was a bunch of stuff like I've, I've certainly gotten into like youtube golf stuff a lot but they had a long drive contest which was cool because it's like th there's some of these guys that play like multiple rounds in a week and then there were also guys who like literally it's their first time picking up a golf club and they were like one of the guys was like yeah i watched a youtube video on the way here i think i'll be fine yeah and they, they did a long drive contest but it's cool to see like these dudes who are amazing athletes which is not typically the person who gets super into golf until like i think maybe tiger woods is the first great athlete that played golf maybe and uh these guys you get to see them one you get to see them struggle which i enjoy that's the thing i miss the most about having <laughs> national league pitchers hit is yeah i want to see this amazing athlete do something he's not good at it's the celebrity softball game it's the celebrity basketball game oh that's These, the, my favorite events i was at the celebrity softball yes. game this week and that's how, how was that's, it uh it was like one of the highest scoring celebrity softball it might have been the highest scoring they found guys that could actually play it was kind of crazy i was uh I mean, there was a lot of athletes. You sure. know, there was there was one team that had a bunch of former Mariners: Felix Hernandez, Brett Boone. Uh, I think Mike Cameron was out there too, and that Hell was yeah. kind of unfair because these guys were just dropping bombs. The the funny thing is, when they're setting up for this event, you can kind of measure based on the fence lines at T-Mobile Park where they're putting up the temporary fences for the, the softball event. Yeah. And they were maybe like 225 feet away from home play, <laughs> which is very short for slow pitch softball. Like typically sure. a slow pitch softball field that you see at the park that, uh, you know, a beer league game is going on at is about 300 feet. So right. to put these at 225 and then have like ex athletes out there, I mean, it was no problem for these guys, but a lot of the, the actual celebs that they got out there to play, could play. I was shocked. One of the best players on this team, on on either team, was JoJo Siwa. And if you, a lot of Jesus, people probably, I don't even know who this is. Yeah, a lot of people. I, I don't even know exactly what she does. I just know she's in entertainment. She might be an actress, but she's like younger. She's probably like in her early twenties. Um, doesn't look like she'd be that athletic. Really, just kind of looks like an average, an average celeb, right? She was one of the best players out there. She must have played softball in her background because not only could she like hit a little bit, like she wasn't crushing the ball, but she was like, she was totally respectable. But then she's playing left field, and there's a situation where like you kind of have a lot of crazy stuff going on in the infield, and the third baseman basically strays off towards second base. She comes running in from left field to cover third. I was like, that's the kind of heads up play that like I've played <laughs> baseball and or softball my whole life. Most people that I've played with wouldn't have even thought to do that. So for this like random celeb playing in a celeb softball game to go do that, I was like, this is amazing. And then there were these these other like influencer types that I'd never heard of. There's dudes out there jacking home runs that are like yeah. YouTube guys. And you're like, what the hell is going on? 
Uh, so yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, it's it's like what you're saying with with the NFL though. Just watching people out of their element do things yeah. that you wouldn't expect them to do is is somewhat entertaining. Like if they had an average person Olympics, I would totally watch that. Oh that would, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I well, they used to have that Pros versus Joe's show that was oh, like yeah, in concept interesting. Um, but yeah, the I think that that is good, and also like the I think that these leagues are embracing the fact that these events are no longer competitive like nobody's trying to win anymore and so because of that it's like let's just make them entertaining like let's let's do the shit that's like people actually want to see yeah that's an interesting point because i was you know when i watched the all-star game this year it was like the first one i've watched start to finish in many many years and you know really the appeal was that it's in the ballpark i know so i have to watch it right but I was kind of surprised because towards the end of that game, you could tell that all the players were really into it. Uh, the mm, last inning was pretty exciting. It was kind of back and forth. It was like a 3-2 final or something. So it's not like it was high scoring by any means, but it was close the entire way. Um, you know, the the game-winning hit is a two-run home run by a 32-year-old catcher for the Rockies who's a journeyman. I mean, he's never yeah. really... He's never really found a home anywhere. He was the Rockies' lone representative, so he's not. It's not like he's a. It's not like he's a big deal, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, and he hits the game-winning home run, which is really cool for him, I'm sure. And um, yeah, once he did that, I mean, everyone was so amped for him. And then you get into the last inning, and all the players are hanging on like every single pitch. When Julio came up to bat in the the bottom of the ninth with a chance to to win it he ends up drawing a walk but um you know after the game the uh one of the the on-field reporters asked craig kimbrell he gets the save for the national league he asked him what he thought of the finish because he's on the mound he's got the winning run on first base the tying run on second pretty high leverage situation and kimbrell uh he actually got a little emotional which was kind of like crazy to see because like you just wouldn't expect that in an all-star game sure And he's talking about how he, when Julio came to bat in his his home ballpark, uh, you know the crowd obviously everyone got up on their feet and was and was very enthusiastic. Kimbrel said in that moment he took a step off the back of the mound and just kind of like looked around to soak it all in because he thought seeing Julio come to bat in his home ballpark was like one of the coolest things he'd seen. Mm. And that's the guy who's on the mound in that moment trying to defeat him. You know, yeah. like he, the fact that he could appreciate what was going on around him while also trying to basically put a stop to it was right. uh, was really remarkable to see. It was I mean, like, like you said, I mean, in the, the football, the Pro Bowl and in the NBA All-Star game, it feels like there's just not a lot of passion for being there or for wanting to compete at a high level. But at least with the baseball all-star game, it feels like it's still there. And uh, that's cool to see. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I'm, so I'm pulling up uh, Craig Kimbrell's career because I, my, uh, my suspicions I think are somewhat correct, which is he spent the vast majority of his career in the national league. Yeah. And so he hasn't played it. And, and, and the, the, the sole, is it the only time he's been in the American league was with Boston. So he's not in the Mariners division. His experience in T-Mobile park slash Safeco field probably is not anything like this. This is probably the first time he's ever seen it. I mean, I guess he came with Boston, so yeah. he probably did see it full with Boston fans. Like the the when he's he's probably never been there and seen the fan base fully behind the guy that's batting. Yeah, I mean, I think a, a lot of guys were kind of talking about the atmosphere in the ballpark there. And I think there was a lot of things that played into it. I mean, some of the guys as they were talking with some of the ex players on the broadcast, you know, they had David Ortiz, Derek Jeter, A Rod on the broadcast. These guys were talking about how nice the weather was, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, because usually they're in like a Midwest city where it's like 90 degrees with 80% humidity. And it's like, even though on TV it might look nice and sunny, it's just miserable to be there, you know, and it's probably not, it doesn't feel great as, a, as an athlete yeah. going out there and running around and exhausting yourself, right? But yesterday it's 70, 75 degrees at first pitch for the all-star game and then you've got like a perfectly cloudless sunny sky like low humidity it's like the perfect like the perfect conditions for playing baseball and they were talking a lot about that you brought the best fans out to the ballpark and i know they were the best fans because i saw multiple people on twitter talk about people in the stands trying to start the wave and getting shut down Hell yeah. <laughs> Getting Hell shut yeah. down by the people around them. So it's like you go to any Mariner game during, you know, an average season, a wave will often break out. 
but it's a bunch of fair weather people or people that are just there casually. It's like once you bring the hardcore yeah, baseball fans out, bored. they want to watch. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the 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 wave is for people who are bored by baseball, right? And who want like are just thrilled to have something to do yeah. because they've been <laughs> bored for the last two hours, right? Yeah, if I'm at like the All Star game in front of a packed house, like I want to. I want to watch the game. I don't want to have. Yeah. I don't want to have to stand up every minute because you want to like do this choreographed cheer. Like yeah. I, I'm not like a band the wave type person necessarily. You know, if it's Tuesday night and there's ten thousand people at the stadium and no one seems to care about the team, by all means. But sure. but read the room. You know, understand the moment. So you get all like these very knowledgeable baseball fans out there for this event, packed house. Um, you know, I think a lot of times Seattle can just get a bad rap about their sports fans in general, or yeah. certainly not maybe with the NFL, but with baseball for sure. And when the when you have a big event like this, or the team is winning, we saw it last year at the end of their at the end of the season during their postseason run. Uh, the the good baseball fans here that show up are smart and like mm-hmm. really actually appreciate the game. And it was cool to see that the players understood that that they felt that and they were able to like even talk about it after the fact the way that a guy like Kimbrel did yeah yeah i think uh the the seahawks fan base i always defend seattle's fan base even the the seahawks fans who i think people find annoying and i think that is not obviously i mean you're i think one of those people it's not (laughs) uh mutually exclusive to not liking the seahawks um i always i mean i think a good example of this and i always used to defend red sox fans is Fan bases of popular teams, you're just going to see a lot more of them, and the most annoying people will be the most annoying people. And so I think right. that I don't think the Seahawks fan base or really the Boston fan base is that much different, except for they've experienced success. And the Mariners fan base is right now, it's people who get probably free tickets. And I mean, not, not right this moment but like in the last 20 years it had devolved to a point where it was like people who get free tickets or people who are like actually really baseball fans yeah, yeah and now you're probably we probably will start to see an influx of because they're more popular because they're more successful we'll see an influx of people who are are bad fans who are uh fans because it's like the trendy thing to be is to be a mariners <laughs> fan right. and that's i mean that's i just I, I don't think the mariners are any different than any other fan mariners fan base seattle fan bases are any different than any other fan base yeah i think when it comes when you look at it at like a, a civic level you know just taking a look at an entire city obviously you can have differences between you know your football team your baseball sure. team whatever but i think as you kind of segment it by sport right like I feel like it's a lot easier to be a football fan, right? When your team is on defense, just scream. Just yeah. scream the entire time. And when they're on offense, be quiet. That's mm-hmm. it. That's really all you have to understand. It, when you're a fan of a baseball team, even like basketball or hockey, there has to just be more knowledge of the situation and like understanding when you're supposed to cheer and when you're supposed right. to yell. It's, you know, it's different if it's a kid or whatever. Like I used to, when I was a kid, I would go to the kingdom and I would scream at the speakers on the ceiling thinking they were microphones. So <laughs> I was like a football fan at a baseball game, but like there is like some knowledge of understanding the situation and like that goes in, to being a baseball fan and really even like some of the other sports beyond football. So while I do find uh, <laughs> the 12s can be annoying at times, they know how to serve the a purpose and, uh, you know, make their role as impactful as it can possibly be, which is all you ask of any fan. Like sure. whatever your role is as a fan, just try to be impactful, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Can we talk about Britney Spears and Victor v- Weminyama? <laughs> Because we can, we can. Yeah. So the what happens is, and I the the story's kind of changed. Is this report comes out because Britney Spears? I think she tried to get ahead of it, and uh, I, w- I want to say a thing real quick because there's something that's I think there's something wrong with me, Alex. Because so <laughs> so Br- Britney Spears comes out and says that she had an embarrassing thing happen. She got in an altercation with Victor Wembanyama's security. She posts a big thing on Instagram, and Britney Spears. <clears throat> that's had an interesting couple years and what i think is wrong with me is that i got to tell you that this version of britney spears this like 40 plus year old woman several children going through what seems like a true mental crisis at different times is so much more attractive to me than the young- <laughs> i was like not a britney i was like not oh, a britney no. spears guy this this is like i i think maybe it's like a thing where she's 
like maybe feels more attainable, I guess. But the other thing about this, and I'm I'm gonna be Team Brittany on this one, Alex, because if Victor the problem is if you came up to a man your or my age, we're both in loving relationships, we're loyal, loyal men to our wives, but if you came up to a man mine and your age and you're Britney Spears and you tap us on the arm because you want to congratulate us on our success as she's saying or whatever. <laughs> I'm taking a moment to talk to Britney Spears. Okay. But you know who I'm not taking a moment for is like Farrah Fawcett because I don't recognize Farrah Fawcett off the top of my head because right. she's significant. And this is amazing. And it's heartbreaking for me that Victor Wembanyama does not have the respect to for Britney Spears because he's too young. He's fucking 19 years old. He's too young. He didn't grow up here so yeah. even though britney spears is an international superstar uh yes. a lot of the time that she was an international superstar probably preceded victor Wembanyama's uh consciousness <laughs> so yeah. i mean she's yeah, literally like been famous since i was in middle school which means that she could be his mom very easily like without <laughs> without like having a huge lifestyle question she could i think she could have had him at like how old is britney spears and by the way She's got to be right I, around 40, right around 40, I would think. I want to reiterate that I think Britney Spears is a... Genuinely, it's, she's 41 years old. So she he's 19. She could have had him at 22. That's not like an age... Like, of course, you and I were fucking 900 years old when we have kids. But that's not an age where you're like, what happened in your life? You know, a lot of people have kids at that age. <laughs> It's like, he's got to be, she's an international superstar. He's got to be like, yeah, my mom was into you. Like, what the fuck? It's a wild story to me because, first of all, I wouldn't expect Britney Spears to know who Victor sure. Wanyama is. I mean, other than the fact that she sees a guy who's seven four who doesn't look like any other yeah. human on the planet walking around. You have around. to imagine that like, Britney Spears isn't in whatever. I don't even know. I can't. I didn't look at the story enough to know if they're in whatever Chili's or whatever in, in Vegas. I don't know what they're actually, <clears throat> where they actually are. But you have to imagine she's not going anywhere alone. So somebody on her team had to be like, that's Victor Wanyama. Yeah. And it's it seems like it's somewhat unclear what happened, other than she approaches Victor Wembanyama. Everyone seems to agree on that. Wembanyama, we don't know how he even reacts. All we know is that his security staff, which is the San Antonio sure. Spurs security personnel around him, like attack mm -hmm. Britney Spears. That's that's basically what we are led to believe is that they they hit her to fend yeah. her off from attacking Victor Wembanyama, their their prized draftee. Right. That's that's all we know. Really, what what happened? And uh, from there, you just it all seems ridiculous. I mean, this is a very large man who probably doesn't need that much protection, let alone from this tiny yes. woman who happens to be one of the most famous women yes. in the entire world. It's just like, it's such a weird mesh of events that have led to this, that you're like, what even like, if you're on the, if you're one of the security personnel, you have no excuse. Women Yama, he sure. has an excuse. He's an 18 year old. Who's not from America. He can, he might not know who Brittany is and that's fine. But if you're this guy that works for the Spurs, you should be able to turn around and see, okay, even if you don't recognize Britney Spears, this is a harmless woman. Is, am am I right that the, you shouldn't be able to look at a person like that and be like, that's Britney Spears, don't Am I right her. that the, we have not gotten the tapes? We have not seen the tapes yet, right? Because the, the new, the new report is <laughs> that the police say that she hit herself, which is insane. Uh, and I'm insane feels a lot <laughs> less sensitive in this moment. But I, I, I think, one, I think there's a chance that Britney Spears isn't going out into public in Vegas like in a big Britney Spears t-shirt in her, you know, like it's possible she's dressed <laughs> down and maybe not in disguise, but like, you know, in sunglasses and a t-shirt or whatever. And I, I'm sure what she wants is like a, what she's got to be going for is like one of those celebrity like selfies or pictures together with a new young guy to post on Instagram, right? That's got to be what she's going for. There's no way. I mean, it'd be a hell of a photo because she's probably like, she's at like yes. dick height. So <laughs> those photos are always interesting. I mean, they just are. There's one from like many years ago. Where, Dick Height's uh, actually the alias that Fall. I go by when I go to hotels <laughs> so that my fans don't Dick swarm Height. the hotel looking for Casey McLean. Uh, yeah, there's a photo that's been circulating for years where uh, you've got like 
Taco Fall, who's like this very tall center for the Boston Celtics at the time, is standing next to, uh, I believe it's Tracy Wilson, who's a sideline reporter in sports, who's like five foot mm-hmm. two or something, very small woman. And like just the juxtaposition yeah. is entertaining. Or there's the one of Aaron Judge and Jose Altuve standing next to each other. Anytime you see those photos, they're funny. So yeah, Weminyama standing next to Britney Spears, that would have been like a meme yeah. forever. It would have. So she knew what she yeah. was doing. If that, that's what she was going yeah, I, for. Well, I, yeah, I. I almost guarantee whoever's on her team is like it would be opportunistic for you to go get a picture with that guy again. I. I don't think you. I don't think she's like grinding summer league games out. You know, I don't think she's like taking scouting reports, <laughs> or you know, I. I like I. I. I, ser- I seriously doubt she's an actual fan of Victor Wembanyama, which is fine. I think that's listen, Brittany. I'm not going to, my security detail will not punch you. You want free tickets, lifetime offer, free tickets to a comedy show, Britney Spears. Uh, you should just put you know, her on the list every time from here yeah, on Yeah, I'm going to put her case. on the list just in case you happen to be in Oak Harbor, Washington on July 27th. I will make sure that you can get in <laughs> to... Or if you're can you at, at least get her like one, house. maybe a more accessible show? At least get her Tacoma <laughs> Comedy Club or something. Something a little bit more highbrow, please. <laughs> this is Britney Spears. My God. I don't. Britney Spears doesn't get on a ferry, uh, God damn it. Uh... Yeah, no way. Not, they, they, they probably have an airfield <laughs> she could take her private jet to. Um, yeah, I, I, it's 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 funny because it's I feel very old with this story, which is I think what the embarrassing thing for Britney Spears is is this kind of realization and the kind of karma of being famous as a child and then watching fame for everybody like ebbs and flows, right? Like Britney Spears is not in the middle of a career renaissance right now. Uh, I think she's doing fine. I think she has like a residency in Vegas. I think that's why she's there. But she's not. It's like, uh, did you did you ever listen to? You're are, you're a hip hop guy a little bit. You're just like a whatever's popular guy. So yeah, uh, which is fine. Yeah, I'm a yeah, front that's runner. Fine. That's, yeah, fair weather. So Jay Z put out that album <laughs> 444 a couple years ago, um, and it was like what I liked yeah. about it. It was like. I'm not talking, I'm not, I'm no longer saying I'm like the best going right now. It's like, it was very much like that dude's going to start rapping about getting colonoscopies pretty soon. And I love that. Have you ever, have you, yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen the movie? This is 40. I don't think so. It stars Paul Rudd and Leslie Mann. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a spinoff sequel of Knocked Up. Sure. Yeah. Seth I, I, Rogen, I you think I might've seen it. I definitely, it, I definitely have seen Knocked Up many times. Yeah. It's a Judd Apatow film. And, uh, it came out, I don't know, about 10 years ago now. This is 40. And it's like the most, like you go into it. I, I remember seeing it in theaters thinking, oh, this is like a spinoff sequel to Knocked Up. So it's going to be hilarious. Knocked Up was kind of a seminal film yeah. in like, like that comedy era where, you know, comedy movies were seemingly coming out every week. You know, it's been a little while. It's been a few years. Now we're going to go see This is 40. Paul Rudd. Everybody loves Paul Rudd, right? He's like the one of the biggest actors on the planet. Uh, it's like the worst movie ever because it's like too real. I, it's too real about being 40. And it sounds like this is what the, the JC album was like. It's just too real. You're like, yeah, that we, we need a distraction. No, from our I like it. Lives. The, the, we don't need the, to like, we don't need to be like more. My memory is it. liking this is 40 and this album. I liked it. I like the thing where the guy's like, God, I got to get my credit together. I'm 50. You know what I mean? Like, it's not literally that, but I, I do <laughs> like how Jay-Z has aged as a rapper where there, he's not having these moments because he knows where he stands. And Jay-Z is still an enormous figure. He's a bad example. But there's other guys like, like Cameron and stuff like that that are not these like billionaire moguls that are like i love that hip-hop is just aging into itself like there's now 50 plus year old rappers all over the place and it's fucking great because they're still going to be making music that's relevant to you and me maybe it's not going to be on the radio station that you listen to it's not going to hit the pop charts so you might not be aware of it it's going to be on <laughs> yeah, the oldie station fucking, you're so right <laughs> i remember having a realization i was driving to I uh, visit my wife in Ellensburg and I was driving over the pass and the old school lunch came on cube 93 and I heard welcome to Atlanta on the old school lunch. And I was like, Oh no, this is, <laughs> this is like, this feels like it was yesterday. Oh, this song yeah. came out and it was, yeah. it was uh, cause that was like the hip hop oldies at the time. Now it's got to be, I mean, that was, that was like 13 years ago. Now we, now we're, like that song is a relic. They literally play that on like KZOK okay now, probably. It's it's very strange because we're gonna be, you know, maybe the generation just ahead of us is really the first sure. generation, but we'll be one of the first generations where our oldies will be like filthy rap and, songs. 
rap. Yeah, it's gonna be weird because like the. And I'm sure this is how it is for like our parents' generation when we were listening to oldies that were like from the 50s and 60s, right? Like that was edgy yes. music for them. And that's how we look at like hip hop and rap. And that's, it's going to be the same thing. No one's ever going to think that yeah, stuff well, is they, Yeah, like Elvis now. <laughs> uh, like Elvis, they used to be like, you, right. the, he is, those are satanic hip motions. And now I remember when I was in the eighth <laughs> grade, my teachers was playing music and it was like, you know, classic rock bullshit. And uh, he's like, I just don't know what, a teacher when like if if one of you becomes a teacher i don't know how you're going to play any of your music and now it went from like hip-hop used to be very you know whatever edgy for its time and now it's like wet ass pussy and so like it's like it's just so much more bald and uh not the pussies i'm talking about the like, you know, philosophically <laughs> well, the, bald maybe, yeah, that maybe, too. maybe that too but the but I, i'm like it's it's uh i i think about like what my parents wouldn't let me watch versus the shit my daughter's been exposed to we were watching a show the other day this is embarrassing as a parent but uh she goes he's not supposed to say fuck and we're like hey hey hey, hey. one you're right he shouldn't he Neither shouldn't say you. it but also you can't <laughs> say it please don't say that at daycare like uh yeah it's yeah. A- no we, we're we're definitely less sensitive to language mm-hmm. just the words themselves well, unless right? it's, like that unless uh, it's a certain type of word like i think there's more words you're not allowed right. to say but the words that were considered profanity they're doesn't di- matter anymore it's all just offensive by they're different words now yeah there's kids running around i heard some kid the other day <laughs> i was out i was out golfing and there was like houses alongside one of the holes and there's uh, some kids playing in their backyard and they got like an above ground swimming pool which probably says a lot about them as people <laughs> And maybe they why should be allowed to speak over they no, want. No, no wow. offense, no wow. offense to a to above ground. Swimming. I think you people are great. Uh, so anyway, you're the Britney the Spears pool. of my life. Above ground people. <laughs> this this kid is probably like ten years old. The other kids there around the same age. There's like three or four of them. And one of the kids goes, "The fuck you think you're doing?" And this isn't like this is in Maple Valley. This is. Not <laughs> I was like. This that's different to hear that. I actually shouted language <laughs> from the course. They th- well, they thought okay. it was funny. Uh, but they, but man, I, and th- there was a parent out there too. It's not like it was just the kids. There was an adult out there who was just like, yeah, he, he says yeah. that sometimes. Yeah, it's uh, it's why I got like my mom stopped me from watching Doug because they called someone a butthead, and like that Doug was banned in our house. I never let her see Ren and Doug. Stimpy after that. Like we were, we were going to watch Ren and Stimpy until the, the wheels fell off. But uh, yeah, now like my daughter's seeing stuff where they're like, it's like Danny McBride shows. We've been, we watched, uh, we've been watching right yeah. gemstones <laughs> and uh, vice principles, both great, by the way, Danny McBride. I don't think he's oh, man. Vice. I need to get back into vice two seasons. Cause I actually watched that when it first yeah, came two out. Two seasons. Yeah. Really great. My wife's a teacher, so she likes it a lot. Okay. I want to talk about our last sports thing. Cause I, uh, I am, getting these fucking invasive text messages and my and I, yeah you need to tell me what's going on here i don't know exactly what's well, happening no, no. here but this seems like a big well big no that's story. not the one that you're uh, we were gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna ignore the tom oh. brady stuff he's dating kim kardashian maybe who okay. gives a shit what i want to talk about is the start of <laughs> shohei watch otani watch in seattle because it's gonna be <sighs> so fucking obnoxious in my opinion because it's like, remember a couple of years ago when Prince Fielder, it was like everyone, Prince Fielder will be a Mariner next year. That'll solve all the problems. And then he doesn't sign in Seattle. And it's, I feel like we're headed for that same thing where Shohei Otani is going to sign the largest contract of any baseball player in history. And he will deserve it. And the Mariners are not yes. going to pay him that contract. Yeah. And But we're in, Probably we're not. in this moment where, I mean, I will say, and I've said this to the, in the past to you the one like cultural advantage that seattle has is with japanese and asian Amer- or Asi- asian american asian born players because there is an asian culture here because there's a history of japanese players having success here because it's geographically close to asia maybe geographically closer than any other uh any other team in baseball but Otani already spurned the Mariners once. That all was true when he came back. The Mariners aren't bringing in Asian talent constantly anymore. That used to be when an Asian player would come around, you'd be like, oh, Kenji Jojima. Of course he'll be in Seattle. Uh, Kaz Sasaki, Ichiro. Like, of course they're going to Seattle. There's uh, What was the dude? What was that shortstop's name a couple years ago? Um, Oh, my God. I can't think of it. 
Oh, uh, Munonora Kawasaki. Yeah, and then I'm, God, I'm already at the, yeah. the picture that they just... Yeah, there's been... There's a bunch. There, there's been, yeah. like... Uh, Hisashi Iwakuma. Yeah, there's not been Hisashi others, Iwakuma, yeah. But there was the dude, the dude just a couple of years ago whose name escapes me, who's like, I think he may be in Toronto just giving up home runs left and right. Um, yeah, oh, Kikuchi, yeah, you said Kikuchi. Yeah, you said Kikuchi. So, uh, I guess there's been, like, kind of a steady stream, but there's not, like... It's no longer the default is that guy's going to Seattle for sure. And yeah. again, he already spurned Seattle once. He wants to play for a winner. This is not a team with a, a, a winning history. Maybe he wants to change that. Maybe he would. The organization would make promises to him. Whatever. The point is, there's going to be just months of consternation over this for something that has like a microscopic yeah. probability of happening. <clears throat> in my opinion. Yeah, every every team in baseball wants Shohei Otani, so it's really going to come down to where he wants to play. This is a roller coaster. I mean, I think there's always going to be this roller coaster effect with Otani because obviously there was this huge flirtation with him when he was first coming to, to yeah. Major League Baseball from Japan. A lot of a lot of Mariner fans thought he was going to end up here because of that history you just mentioned with Japanese players. The rumor is Seattle was his sure, second choice, the runner up, which counts for nothing. But and who knows if that's mm. even true, right? Um now, you know, a year ago or so, fans are getting themselves all gassed up about Otani coming here after this season when he's a free agent. He's gonna come here because Seattle was always his second choice and uh he didn't really win with the Angels. He hasn't really won with the Angels. Why would he go back there? And then in the last few months, especially after this past offseason, you know, fans are out again. We're out. Otani's not right. coming here. He's not going to come here. Why would he want to come play for this franchise, especially this 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 ownership group that can't even spend money in this offseason to bring in uh, bats yeah. to build off this momentum they had last year during the playoffs? So, you know, as of a week ago, we're down on Otani. Otani there's no way in hell Otani's coming here. And then yesterday – during the All-Star game, Otani plays. He gets done. The fans are chanting for him to come to Seattle while he's up to bat. He gets pulled after the game, and he goes and does his media availability. He tells the media that he loves Seattle, that he spent the last couple sure. off-seasons here, that he likes coming here, and not just coming here, but he's willingly chosen to spend his free time here outside of the season. Now everyone's back. We're all back in. Otani is he is coming to Seattle. It doesn't make any sense. Why would he come here? We probably can't afford him. Uh, we don't have a yeah. winning history. But he's, he expressed his love and adoration for the city of Seattle, and that's all we needed. That's all we needed to hear to be back on this bandwagon, expecting him to come to Seattle. But I, I ultimately think you're right. I don't think there's any way he ends up here because I don't think – the organization is willing to spend that kind of money and he's going to get 600 to 700 million dollars i mean if you think if he's the best pitcher and the best hitter in baseball right now mm -hmm. if you don't think he's the best he's definitely top five and top five pitchers and top five hitters are commanding 500 million dollar contracts just for being the best hitter or the best pitcher and he is both well to be clear so that, you, that's it's, not actually it's true. almost largest like, contract in baseball right now is mike trout 426 million Okay, so they're getting $400 million contracts sure. for being the best hitter or the best pitcher. So if you were saying that 400 mil was the going rate for the best hitter or the best pitcher, then you could argue that he deserves double the salary, right? Because he's the best of both. On top of that, he's mm -hmm. kind of a cheat code because when you think of roster limits being 26, right? Like having a guy that does both things that well really gives you flexibility with your roster that you don't have mm -hmm. otherwise. So you know the mariners especially are one of those teams that so value roster versatility to ha i'm sure like jerry depoto jerks off to the thought of shohei otani in a mariners I, I gotta, like why wouldn't he? he loves he loves the roster flexibility and he's the best i gotta imagine for jerry depoto jerking off to shohei otani is like cuckold porn for him at this point because he probably was really into it a long time ago many years <laughs> yeah, ago probably. six years ago or whatever and now he's he has to watch someone else uh not succeed the same way he could be not succeeding with that same guy <laughs> i i said many years yeah, ago that i think yeah. that uh uh and i've said it taught on this podcast i think also that i think the day jerry depoto got fired was the day shohei otani signed with La the los angeles angels of anaheim when he signed with the angels i still hate that name by the way it's like we're decades into this name it's bad it's terrible it's um, terrible yeah 
I don't know. I, I, I guess I don't know. Is Depoto on the hot seat? Is, is he going to even get a chance to exercise that demon? Because I do think, it's just, and, and I don't think this was the plan, but to come away with Julio and Shohei at some point out of that would be a pretty big win. But is he going to ever be the guy that gets to like kind of uh, enjoy the fruits of that labor? And do you even believe that? I mean, it's, I don't know. I, I guess like to me, I'm so done with Depoto personally. Yeah. Like, like I'm, I'm just so like bo- I think he's such a such a just like boring, uh, middle of the road, like not an analytics guy, not a baseball guy. GM, he's like such a such a politician as a GM. I'm ready to end the Jerry Depoto era and let's let's I guess let's make the GM uh, Shohei Otani's parents or something like that. Like do do like basketball teams do <laughs> yeah, where they it's... bring on uh, the the parent right. the dad is like the basketball coach. Yeah, it, it's no one's going to lose their job for not landing Shohei Otani. But I agree with you that the Depoto era has pretty much run its course. I mean, this is, it doesn't matter, you know, if you've, if you, unless you've won like a championship, getting as much time as he has, which he's like in his eighth year, yeah, ninth year now. Yeah, 2016 was his first I year. I mean, that's a long, that's a long time to be a GM of any team or, you know, I know he's president of baseball ops now, but to just be in that capacity for that long without any real success is kind of remarkable. So I totally agree with you. I mean, there's just fatigue. For a guy like that, uh, I mean, he's going to get the opportunity to sign Shohei at least. We'll see what that becomes. I, it's just going to be one of those things where it's like, I don't think Otani is going to sign right away. It's probably going to drag on through the off season because why would you? It's going to be very hard for teams to determine his market value. Like people are saying, six to seven hundred million. That number could it could fall well short of that or it could potentially eclipse that, you know, because we just don't know. We've never had to give a contract to a guy like this. Yeah. Nobody even knows what this should look like. Right. Yeah. So it's just going to be so wild that it's like, you could have a team like the Dodgers come in and just offer such an exorbitant amount of money that it won't matter. The difference with a guy like Otani is he's not represented by one of those agents like a Scott Boris type that just wants to squeeze the most money out of, every team in baseball right so he's he probably has more say in where he goes than maybe a lot of players would and he seems to be one of those guys that he he does what he wants to do you know he's not going to let his agent lead him down a path and and also like this contract presumably is going to be the last one he ever signs so he better be somewhere that he wants to be or else it's really going to suck you know like obviously like the Yankees and Mets and any team like with a big payroll like that is, has kind of come up as like potential suitors for Otani. But I don't think, you know, for a guy who's pretty humble and seems pretty down to earth and probably wants some connection to be able to get back to Japan from time to time, it, it really seems like the West coast is the most likely yeah. place for him to land. Like I can't imagine he would do well in like the media hot box that is New York. It just probably, it probably would not be fun for him, and that's that would suck, especially if you were signed to like a ten year contract. How miserable would you be for the rest of your career? Yeah, you know, I, it's just it. You know, he's. It, I guess the, the last thing I'll say is he's he's had the luxury of being in a market in Anaheim that, while they have not succeeded, no one is really pressuring them to succeed, and so sure at least that is like kind of a nice thing to have. If he was in New York with the the level of success his team has had the stories written about him would be completely different because there'd be all these expectations on top of him and he wouldn't be the one, you know, even though he's doing his best, the team wouldn't be succeeding and there'd be disappointment because of it. But right now he's in a place where the expectations are low and he gets to kind of, you know, still thrive within that as, as easily the best individual player. In the I game will right say now. the one, one thing and without going into too much like deep uh, MLB like salary talk but uh the it feels like the the dodgers and the padres and even the yankees to a degree like i think show him might be becoming a free agent at a time that's actually advantageous because these teams that have been willing to spend seemingly limitless amounts of money are now years and years into luxury tax payments and and a, a guy that big is just they he will cost them like real life money a lot more than he would cost the Mariners at a, at a lower salary. Right. I mean, everyone, you know, fans that try to give the Mariners front office and ownership group, the benefit of the, de- the benefit of the doubt have been saying like, 
The reason they didn't spend money this offseason and why they haven't spent a lot the past few years <laughs> is because they're trying to clear the books for Otani, which is I think is bullshit yeah, and absolutely. it's a cop out for sure because you could you can do both things. You can still spend money uh, in a way that allows you to win while also not, you know, cash strapping your stuff yeah. for the future. The Mariners, I mean, financially, just from a financial perspective, assuming that they have money to spend and and John Stanton isn't broke, which God only knows at this point, uh, assuming they have money to spend, they might be in better shape financially than almost any team that Otani could potentially yeah. land with. You know, there's teams out there like the Royals of the world. They're just they'll never get Shohei Otani. So we don't need yeah. to talk about that. But for teams that at least have a, a, an inside or outside chance of landing him, the Mariners are probably better equipped to do that than most. And really, it just comes down to, are they willing to? I, I personally think, like, Otani might want to come here. It seems like it'd be, like, one of his, on his short list of places he would like to be. But I don't think the ownership group is equipped to put up that yeah. kind of money. I just don't think they are. And that's the unfortunate reality of where baseball is. You know, unlike a lot of these other major sports, baseball is, the salaries are, more exorbitant they just are there's no salary cap there's there is a penalty for going over certain amounts but most owners out there with money don't seem to care about that penalty whatsoever and yeah. it's it's the the guys like john stanton who kind of get um who have a hard time keeping up because they're not willing to go over that limit or spend as frivolously as some of these other teams might be yeah absolutely um well it's just going to be you know we don't need to devote any more time to it because it's going to be a constant topic for the next fucking you know nine months it's gonna be heartbreaking in the end yes heartbreaking we will all experience heartbreak as mariners (laughs) fans yet again something we're very familiar with all right let's let's play the home run game um i have a proposal for the home run game and this might just be me trying to make it more competitive for myself but we've we've slowly pared away the information that we give to the other person about that player down to now we just do career length and i want to take the last leg out from under the process I, I think we should omit career length. Wow. That's what I'm saying. I think I think we name the person. Okay. You could talk. I'm, yeah, and I, I think this might be work against me. It might work for me. It's possible. Uh, <laughs> that's and fine. I, I'm fine with it. I feel like I know most of the career lengths in general, but it does it does handicap my yes. process. I, well, I mean, I've also adopted the process to much less success, but I think that I think that it would be interesting <laughs> to hear. Each of us make guesses how far off we are on those guesses, like how long did they play, how many teams did they play for, etc. And then, and then I think it'll be. Uh, wh- I also think it'll be a little more. I think we'll miss by more is the biggest advantage, which I think is more fun personally. That's not why I miss all the time. It's not like. <laughs> by the way, I just realized that makes it sound like I'm like actually what I'm doing is way more fun. <laughs> I just think it's like the challenge makes it more fun is my suspicion and. Okay audience feedback if you hate that listen we're we're uh like britney spears we are slaves to you and we will do <laughs> we will do anything you want uh, oh wow that, i cannot oh, believe man. how good that callback worked <laughs> good good reference really okay good uh yeah now now instead of slap fighting with both hands we will be slap fighting with one hand <laughs> which is what everyone wants to see it's just a never-ending that's, slap fight. that's what people want do you want to go first, or do you want me to go? Sure, first? I will go first, Alex. Uh, my pick, and I, I mean, I think the other thing about this is since we're not giving all this information, and we already do this already, is we got to have some level of familiarity. It's got to be either a somewhat contemporary player to the time when you and I started watching baseball, or a guy who's so famous like Lou Gehrig that we knew about his career. Uh, enough to to I, you probably stuck it within three on that one. Um, I find those are the toughest, but yeah, the the couple times you've given me those older players. But if, if it's an older player, it's got to be like close. a guy like Ted Williams. So it's the the list's going to be yeah. short on who the who those guys are going to be. Right. Okay, mine is uh, Matt Stairs, who is amazingly was never a Mariner, ah. and uh, yeah, that. We, we we brought his name up a few weeks ago in talking about somebody else who I was hope similar. that you weren't I can't remember who, considering who him as a uh, as a person. No, I never if, looked him. If you I miss never him by a lot, numbers, or I, if I uh, would have missed him by a lot, um, I'm glad that it's me putting it on you. Yeah, Matt Stairs. Uh, here's what I know about him. He uh, he had a very long career. Uh, I don't know if very long is the right, word, but I, I feel like it had to be like 15 to 20 years. Um, cause he 
played during the era when I collected baseball cards. And I remember having cards from him from the early nineties <laughs> and then like all the way into the, the early two thousands. So maybe like, maybe more like 10 to 15. Um, but he played for a long time. He was never like a regular. He was always like a hired gun bat. He was a pinch hitter for a while. He's like the, he's a stubby looking Canadian. He's kind of like a five foot eight inch, two hundred fifty pound lumberjack. Stubby looking type Canadian dude. is. I wish I was Canadian <laughs> yeah. so I could adopt that as my nickname. <laughs> but he he could hit the ball hard. I mean, he kind of like Mark Witten, who you've used in the past. He's just a guy that could just hit the ball really hard and really far. Um, man, okay, I think maybe he played about. 15 years i don't think he was ever like a, a full season type player so if he averaged maybe 15 to 20 a year if that let's say 20 a year over 10 full seasons the equivalent of 10 full seasons that'd be 200 home runs and he probably is a little bit less than that i'll say 185 the my taking the legs out has worked alex 265 oh, home runs okay that's not as it wasn't it wasn't a thought. horrible miss what i realized i was looking up uh candidates for this yesterday what i did not know is that in the late 90s uh so 97 98 99 he had 27 26 and 38 home runs um Okay. Those 98, yeah. 99, he actually had uh, 593 and 623 plate appearances. So he was basically a full-time player in those seasons. He actually got MVP votes in uh, in 1999, which is which is amazing. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, impressive. 38 home runs, though. 38 home runs, 102 RBIs, 533 slugging percentage. A guy who kind of fits in, in uh, every era of baseball. He's a... I mean, the one thing he can't do is field the ball, but he's like a big platoon guy, uh, could nominally play an outfield position, I guess. I don't think he ever was really a good outfielder, would be my suspicion. I haven't looked up any stats on it, but a guy, like you said, just absolutely the body beat type the shit says out of the no. ball. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if he would have actually had a better career if the – if we had the the universal DH like we have now, yeah. I mean that is a guy that would have thrived with having job opportunities in both leagues like they they have now. But back then, with only the AL team, it's funny because I feel like he played more of his career in the NL, but was really built to be a DH. He, oh, by the way, he played uh, nineteen years, five of them with Oakland, which is where I remember him the best. Okay. Three with Kansas City, and then a, just like a bunch of scattered other teams, which is kind of I think where. That's another reason why he was difficult. He's like got one year. I think he played for uh, what, what was it, like twelve or thirteen major league baseball teams, and yeah, the one he played the ones in the lot. National League. Like yeah. he played three years, three separate years with the Washington Nationals, which is they must be counting Montreal years in those. Yeah, yeah, they obviously. I think they very obviously are. Mm -hmm. um, so he he finished his career with Washington at 43 years old in 2011, where he played 56 games and had 74 <laughs> plate appearances. I definitely don't remember him lasting until 2011. Uh, so he must have just been barely hanging on at that point. But yeah, he was obviously pretty old, mid 40s, still playing in the in the league. Uh, that that probably I think if I would have known the years that would have helped a little bit. But I think. I mean, I don't. I don't think that that was a terrible miss for b the information I had because yeah. I really I undershot his years played for sure, but uh, I also I undershot everything, so it could have been a lot worse. Well, I, I think if you said twenty right. a year, I think you might have extended the prime a little bit if if uh, if you had twenty yeah. years. I think yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I rushed to a conclusion there, and I, I needed to think more about. Oh, the, about now, that now you're uh, the, right. the, a new process is born today. <laughs> We're going to figure it out next week. We'll figure out what the process is, and then I'll just try to emulate. I'll it. I'll have to, to walk close. my way through it more. I, uh, the thing about Matt Stairs is, I distinctly remember having a baseball card of his from 1991 that I think might be his rookie card. But what I don't remember, and this is where it's like, if I had known 19 years, then I would have been like, oh, wow, okay, so he went from like 91 to at least 2010, and that would have totally yeah. changed the guess. So the, this new method, uh, it, it can, I think it, it can definitely hurt you. And I think it's, uh, it, it's, it certainly I is think a double edged sword. I think, I think, this, I think there's a very good chance it's going <laughs> to fuck me even well, more. 
I don't think you picked the right day for this. I will say I had this player picked out before I knew we were changing the format, but I think not knowing all the information could hurt you with this guy. Uh, I'm going to give you a guy who I think he'd be another first ballot Hall of Very Good player. He's a underrated outfielder, um, lefty. I think he was a leadoff hitter for most of his career. Uh, a guy who I don't think we saw a lot of him up here in Seattle because he was mostly in the NL, but really good outfielder. Uh, Steve Finley. Remember Steve Finley? Yeah. Did Steve Finley ever play for the Angels? At the very, towards the very end of his career. Yeah. I think he actually, uh, he, if I remember correctly, he had signed like a sizable contract with them that maybe didn't work out the way they hoped or something like that. But yes, he did play for the angels. Uh, he played for a fair yeah. amount of teams, but, uh, I can't, I can't tell you all about that. Until you <laughs> Steve Finley feels like one of those guys who, if he played his career in the AL, I would know everything about him. And then because he like Tim Salmon type of guy where it's like, I know so much about Tim yeah. Salmon that nobody in the world should know that isn't related to him. <laughs> and just because he played for the angels in the time, my formative. So Steve Finley feels like I'm, I'm taking some context clues off what you said. I don't remember Steve Finley being like a, I, what I'm saying right now is my knowledge of Steve Finley feels very limited. So you're right that there might be a huge opportunity, opportunity for me to swing and miss hard on this one. I, my suspicion, Steve Finley is like a high average 15 ish home runs a year guy. From your description, my his career is either very long or very short. So I'm going to have to pick one and go with that. I'm going to say he played like 11 years in Major League Baseball and I'm going to put his home run total. I'm going to, I think though, Steve Finley was a prospect, like was a real prospect. So probably doesn't have the early year ramp up of game, early career ramp up of games, and maybe has the late career that just ends abruptly. So I'm going to go 15 home runs a year, 11. I'm going to say 175 home runs and then shoot myself in the face when you tell me that I'm millions of home runs off. Uh, it's bad. It, probably could have been worse uh he had 304 Jesus, home I runs. fucking really blew myself i mean it's it's bad but it's only like 130 yeah. ish off which and i was but i was yeah. like 80 ish off so i mean it could have been a lot like i'm saying it could have been a lot worse um you kind of did the exact same thing with him that i did with matt stairs you undershot his career he actually had a 19 year career you were very right about him like not having a big ramp up um he comes up with the Orioles in 1989. His very first season, he actually played 81 games. So unlike a lot of guys who come up and like kind of middle around in September for a little bit and ride the bus back and forth between the minor leagues, he was up and he was playing for half a season right away. The next year, he basically plays a full season. Then he gets traded to Houston along with uh, Ken Caminiti or four, maybe four Ken Caminiti. Um, no, he's he's traded uh, with. Kurt Schilling Jeez. to the Astros in in a in a bad trade, and then uh, he later gets traded by the Astros to the Padres. So he kind of gets shipped around from team to team every couple of years to start his career. Uh, his probably most notable era is like the tail end of his Padres uh, career in the mid '90s to playing with the Diamondbacks. He won the World Series with the Diamondbacks. Um, I think Arizona is probably where he makes his name really the most. And then he kind of hangs around there. So he's 39 when his time with Arizona comes to an end. He goes to the Dodgers in what looks like a midseason deal. Then he goes on this little uh, journey. So the Angels for one season in 05 at the age of 40. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, and then he's in San Francisco at age 41 the year after that. And then he's in Colorado at age 42 the year after that. So he hung around for a long time. I always thought of him as like a high average, more speed guy like you kind of pointed mm -hmm. out. But he had a lot more power than than we thought. 300 home runs is kind of like, it's one of those benchmarks for sure. Yeah. Uh, 271 career batting average, 44.2 career war, really long career, and another guy who's just kind of underrated. You know, never really appreciated during the the steroid era because he wasn't putting up 40 a year. You know, so yeah, led the league yeah. in triples twice. Yeah, he was fast for sure. I mean, he had a season. He had a few seasons where he was over thirty bombs, though. So well, yeah, he he hit two thousand four. Uh, he actually hits thirty. He hit ninety six I mean, in or yeah. in ninety six. He hit thirty in San Diego, which I don't think is a that's not a Petco Park year, but I 
San Diego, no. I believe, had the uh, the marine layer the whole time. So they they definitely had the same marine layer yeah. that we have. Yeah, and then ninety ninety, it's thirty four. Two thousand, it's thirty five. Two thousand four is incredible. He has that's where he splits time between uh, Arizona and the Dodgers, and he ends up hitting thirty six home runs that year at the age of thirty nine, which kind of reeks of late career Barry Bonds, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he uh I, I will say i might so, have had steve finley mixed up with there's like a generic left-handed hitting white outfielder from the like late 80s that i just like there's a bunch of these guys right and i think i had him in yeah. my mind mixed up with one of these other guys and i'm happy to report who that was next week i'll take a moment to to research it but uh yeah, I think I, I might have had him a little bit mixed up with someone else, which is what I was saying. My like, I felt very. This was a great pick because I was very in the dark. Also, you're right. A tough week. If you'd have given me more information, I might have remembered who it was. I probably wouldn't have guessed that much different. But uh, those, it's those those mid career thirty plus home run years that were. I guess he just had a real steady like ninety six to two thousand four. Is got to be. I mean, that's like two hundred fifty of those home runs or something like that. I mean, all these guys like Stairs hitting 38 bombs at the end of the 90s when he's in his at least mid 30s, I assume, yeah. or getting close to it. And Steve Finley being 39 or whatever and hitting 36 bombs in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. Like, we know what's going <laughs> yeah. on. Like, whether, whether you put a needle in you or not, you might have been just doing like Andro, sure. like Mark McGuire. Remember when Mark McGuire had Andro yeah. found in his locker and like it technically wasn't a banned substance? at that moment but it became a band so well, that one felt like one that became banned because they're like well he's doing something obviously so if that's so good we got to ban that one like <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean there's a lot of stuff there was a lot of stuff available at that time and there still is i mean you can still go to like a gnc and probably half the stuff in there is on mlb's sure. band alex is on list. roids right now he's uh, been in gnc just fucking buying stuff from <laughs> under the counter for years that's why he's so buff <laughs> Uh, imagine Just yeah imagine. that's uh well and also he played in arizona which at the time we didn't maybe realize to the degree but it's an incredible hitters ballpark yeah no he uh he was another hall of very yeah, good great player, example i mean sure. like a five-time um, or uh sorry a three-time all-star five-time gold glove i think no maybe two-time all-star five-time fuck i'm all over the place yeah, no, you're right. Two time MVP votes in two different years. Gloves. This is a perfect Hall of Very Good. I gotta contact these people and just let them relinquish the name to me because I don't think they're even doing anything. <laughs> there's anymore. just so yeah. Th there's so many guys whose careers peaked in like the mid to late '90s or early 2000s that are just overlooked because they were not on roids or they weren't on enough roids. <laughs> Yeah. They were putting up numbers that would like Absolutely. blow you away today, but back then, back then they, they didn't stand out at all. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah, well, hey, I got well. This new this new frontier is going to be very interesting. Guessing with limited yeah, information, it, but we it will be fun. I will say uh, two <laughs> things going on: the battery on my computer is about to die, and we're starting to have the like delay. You might be you might have been having it on my side. I think the audience will not know the difference, but you might have seen me like glitching out. I'm getting that with you. But I do want to say I changed my uh, Instagram and um, uh, oh, wow. threads handles to Casey McLean comedy because I've had a lot of people that I try to tell my Instagram handle after the show and I have to spell it out for them and then they're still not getting it right. They think it's V, the letter V, Casey McLean. Some of this might be alcohol related, but Casey <laughs> McLean comedy is easier to remember. Twitter can't have a long enough one, so it's still the Casey McLean, but Twitter might be a fucking... Uh, trash heap pretty soon anyway so uh i still think it's my favorite one but you know um i don't think that are I you on, on threads, threads. yeah we're, you're you're, on threads. i think you were one of my earliest okay, followers too. on threads come check me out and alex might let you follow him on threads who knows i don't know if his account's private there or not yeah you can just follow stay me away from threads. his instagram motherfuckers alex SSM.